Hi everybody, it's Paul. We're gonna do a guitar master class. I wanna go through the most simplistic views of acoustic and electric guitars down to some of the most complex. Hopefully at the end, if you own a guitar, you have a little better understanding of how it was made, what the parts that went into it are, if you need a repair, what the terms that you can use or the repairmen are. Um, but I'm gonna start simple and we're gonna go for it. All right, fair enough. So here we go. So here we have an acoustic guitar. Uh, originally these strings were made out of gut, but now they're made out of nylon. Um, and uh, the guitar um, has a speaker cabinet attached. So the sound is coming out of here and all this wood is vibrating and uh, this is the port of the speaker cabinet. Um, it has body part names, these guitars. Headstock, the neck, the body, the waist, the back, the front. This is called a fingerboard. These little pieces of wire are called frets. This piece here is called a nut where the string starts to vibrate. This is the bridge where it ends vibrating. You've got tuning pegs for changing the tension on the string. Um, the guitar has finish. Uh, but basically, it's a guitar with a speaker cabinet attached, and this is how it all started. Then starting in 1923, somebody got the bright idea. Well, maybe we can start you know, maybe we can plug these things into a radio and it doesn't have to have a speaker cabinet attached. And the electric guitar started. I saw what I thought was the very first electric guitar ever made. It was a Gibson harp guitar and it had a pickup about this long that slid in and out. And the output jack was from the Model T Ford headlight because they didn't have this kind of jack at the time. Um, but anyway, this is an electric guitar, and what you have picking up the sound of these now metal strings instead of nylon strings, uh, these steel strings, are magnetic pickups. And you have ways to change the volume, you have ways to decide which of the coils are on, which of the pickups are on, how much treble it has, uh, all that kind of thing. Um, but you still, once again, you have a headstock, you've got the tuning pegs, the nut, the frets, the inlays, now the first guitar I showed you didn't have inlays, but they started to decide to put markers on so you knew where you were. This would be the 12th fret right here. And there are also dots on the side to tell you where you were as well. These were all modifications that had happened. Um, but essentially, it's a guitar. Um, strings are close to the same length. Um, and uh, you can change the pitch of the strings with your hand. Now, like I said, I'm going to start simple, but we're going to get more complex as it goes on. So this would be an electric guitar with magnetic microphones. So now, you can tune the instrument an octave down, and this would be an electric bass. It's really an electric guitar, but tuned an octave down. The strings are quite a bit longer. Um, there's an extra one on the bottom for a, a B note. You still have the magnetic microphones on it. Um, the controls to change the tone and the volume. Um, you've got a bridge, there's a nut, tuning pegs, inlays, all those things. Um, you know, for music played today, this is part of the, the band. There's usually a bass player, there's guitar players, you know, um, singers, drummers, keyboard players, but this is part of the format of the electric guitar. Then, there's another version of the acoustic guitar, which has steel strings instead of the nylon strings. And these acoustic guitars started to get inlays, so you can see where you are. Side dots on the side to see where you are. Still headstock, tuning peg, nut, bridge. Um, also, they started to put electronics in these acoustic guitars so that you could plug them into a PA system or plug them in in, in your studio so that it wasn't just a microphone that you needed to pick it up. You could also use electronics as well. Um, and still... So there's 
a speaker cabinet attached to the guitar, and this one has some electronics. Also, um, uh, people started to put special kinds of inlays in the instruments. Uh, you started to have uh, different kinds of things to make sure originally, so this did this sound hole didn't crack, but these beautiful rosettes, and um, still it has a fingerboard and all this other stuff. So that's basically Guitar 101. So let's get into Guitar 202. Let's go deeper now, okay? So then, guitar makers started to combine acoustic guitars and electric guitars. And so this is what they call a semi-hollow. Uh, and it's an electric guitar and a, a little bit of an acoustic guitar. Um, here at PRS, we sell a lot of these. There's lots of electrical options for the output. We have one which the pickups are picking up each string individually and combining them and that comes out of here. Or you can come out of this one and come out of the electric pickups and then so you can have two amplifiers at the same time. You can have the PA system and the electric guitar amp all going simultaneously or you can switch between them. You know the guitar is a beautiful format to do a lot of things and um, this was um, a really good way for the instrument to go. We've sold a lot of these kinds of guitars, these hollow bodies. Um, also, we put a sound post in between the top and the back, so if it was played really loud, it didn't feed back through the amplifier. So this is kind of an in-between, uh, but it's not really a compromise. It's a, a really good musical instrument. In addition, um, the magnetic microphones can have either a single coil or a double coil, and I'll get more into that later. Um, they have a different kind of tone, these single coil pickups. Um, you know, when I first started as a guitar maker, there were your single coil guys and your double coil guys, and more and more and more people are playing both, just like people playing electric guitar and acoustic guitar. So now let's get into the parts of making an electric guitar. And I've always said that making guitars starts with a neck. If you're a neck maker, you're a guitar maker. Somebody that makes the body and buys the neck is more of a, a parts guitar maker. But real guitar makers make necks. So I want to go into that whole art form of making a neck. It's a little bit complicated, uh, and I'm going to be somewhat simplistic about it, but let me go into it. So you start out with a blank of wood. This would be a beautiful piece of mahogany. Or you can use a piece of maple or a piece of curly maple like this. And there are other parts that you would use as well. Um, this would be the rough wood of the fingerboard, the, the piece right here on the guitar um, that the inlays go into. Um, you can make that out of a maple wood, you can make that out of a rose wood, you can make it out of an ebony, um, that kind of thing. And if you want, you can put pieces of plastic down each side of the neck. This is what's called binding. Um, and we use binding on some of our instruments. Um, but when you're making a neck, there are some really complicated little things that go on. One, there's a truss rod in the neck. Now you can imagine that when the strings are on the guitar and they're tensioned up, they're going to want to bend the neck this way. And you want something that's going to compensate for that tension on the neck because you don't want the neck really bowed, then the action will be really high in the middle of the neck. It's just not really a good idea. And there are many, many different kinds of truss rods that can be used. There's a simple truss rod, like in the old Gibsons that just um, fixed a, a backwards bow. There are uh, double rods like this where one pulls against the other. Um, Rickenbackers use them. There's lots of makers that use these double rods. Um, here's another kind of double rod that goes in the neck. One rod is being made shorter or longer against the other one. Obviously, if 
this rod here is a standard length and you make this one longer, it's going to bend that way. If this one's a standard length and you make this one shorter, it's going to bend that way. That's how it works. This is kind of the same thing. Um, these typically have been on the le lesser expensive guitars in our industry. It's all encased in a piece of aluminum. Now this is a PRS rod. Um, we don't use a two rods in neck. We use one. And so if we expand these nuts that are on here by twisting the rod um, and you're expanding the back of the neck, it's going to bow the neck this way. If you're condensing the back of the neck, it's going to bow the neck the other way. You can think of it like this. If I make this section of the neck longer, the neck's going to bend this way. If I make this section of the neck shorter, it's going to bend the other way. And it's quite a simple rod. Um, we've spent years and years and years on it. Um, we don't coat them with plastic. Uh, a lot of times people coat them with plastic so they won't buzz or make a noise in the neck, but I don't like those kind of deadening factors that you would have. Um, we're proud of this thing, it works really well, but when you're buying a guitar, you don't know what kind of truss rod they put on in it, and you don't really know exactly um, how it works or how well it works, unless you get out a truss rod wrench and play with it. It's more done on reputation. Um, I'm sure if you look it up on the internet, you can find out, but let me tell you something. There's a lot of different kinds of truss rods, and this thing about neck making, this truss rod that's inserted in this neck is a, a complicated little affair and it's been done a lot of different ways and it's being done a lot of different ways in our industry. The next issue is where do you put these fret slots? So eventually we're going to have a neck that's going to have these pieces of wire down here. Now you can imagine that the distance that these are apart make a big difference in, as to whether the guitar plays in tune or not. You can imagine, I would think, that the distance between the nut and the first fret would make a big difference as to whether the, the first few chords played in tune. You can imagine that if you don't get it right, it's a problem. When I first started making guitars, I would literally get guitars into my shop where all the frets were in the right place, but one of them was off and you could see it, you know, which wasn't cool. We don't see that hardly anymore in our industry, um, but we do have problems with whether the guitars play in tune down here or they play in tune up here. And now that the tuning, so many of the vocals uh, in the uh, Pro Tool ways of making music these days, if the guitar is not in tune with the vocal when it's over, they're going to change the guitar part. So I think this is really, really important. And we spend a lot of time on making sure that these things are within a half a piece of paper thickness of being in the right place. Um, you can get a general idea if that was done well just by sitting down and tuning the guitar and finding out if the chords play in tune, it's important. To that end, when you're done making the guitar, there are all these little adjustments on the bridge on this here that change the length of the string so that the high frets play in tune with the string. The string has a stiffness and you have to compensate for it. It's called setting the intonation. We'll get more into that. All right, so now you have a neck and then you have the art form of what's it feel like when you put your hand around it? How's it rounded over? How, what are the edges like? Is it sharp? Is it, does it feel good in your hand? Um, here's a guitar. You know, you want the thing to, to feel right and uh, we have several neck shapes that we use. Neck shape is an art form in my mind. Um, getting this carve um, this way uh, right off the machine and having it exactly the way we want it's not so easy um, you can see literally if you get a close-up of this you can see that this is the way it came off the carving machine this hasn't been sanded yet it's it's really a uh, uh, a beautiful thing and I want to get a close-up of that also the difference between this neck and this neck is one has frets and the other one doesn't. Those are these metal bars that go across. And I want to get a close-up of this fret wire. This is an art form all by itself, these pieces of fret wire. How wide are they? How tall are they? How are they rounded? Um, what are the teeth that hold the 
fret wire in, what kind of glue do you use to hold those teeth in place. Um, we glue all our frets in. Uh, many companies in our industry don't glue the frets in, but in my experience, if you don't glue them in, they move and the, some, they move up and down and you've got to glue them in place. I think it's really, really important. Um, you know, when I used to level frets, which is a process of making sure that all these are flat in the old shop, if the frets weren't glued in place, they would squeak really loud. And the ones that didn't squeak were glued in place, and the ones that did squeak were glued, weren't glued in place. And uh, that was kind of important. Um, also, as a neck maker, there are these inlays, these little things that you put in to tell you where you are. And I want, I'm going to want to get a close-up of these birds, but these are the bird inlays. Now, my mother was a bird watcher, so for me, putting birds in the neck was fine, but I like inlay work. I enjoy it. It's a real distinction about who made the guitar. Um, if you see the birds in the neck, you know that PRS made the guitar. Um, and these birds can be made out of plastic. They can be made out of shell. They can be made of mother of pearl. But here would be a piece of shell that would make these birds. And you know, we're cutting these things out with machines, with lasers. The holes are beginning cutting out with CNC machinery. Um, it's in the old days. I would be, you know, cutting these little holes out in the neck. Um, but now we have a much more automated way to do it. Um, I like inlay work. Here's another close-up that I'd like you to get. So here's a signature um, trademark that's in the headstock of the guitar. That would be this part right here. And um, this would be glued on top of the headstock right here. So does the guitar have a headstock veneer? You know, does it need one? Is it important? Those are all interesting questions. Like I said, guitar making is neck making. Um, and I think there are a lot of things inside the neck that aren't clear. You don't know what kind of glue they glued the fretboard on with. You don't know if it's going to come off. You don't know what, what kind of glue they glued the truss rod in with. You don't know what's going to come off. There's a lot of things that are unseen. But your instincts, uh, my experience of people's instincts is, is if they sit down and play five guitars and one of them is really making them smile and be happy. You can trust a lot of the things I'm talking about were done right. Here's another neck blank um, that's made out of curly maple. Um, and we cut all the wood away to make sure that the wood is dried really well. We have like 13 stages of drying that we do to make sure that the neck doesn't warp over time. Um, it's important that the frets don't stick out the side of the neck in the wintertime. The reason that happens is because the fingerboard shrinks because it lost water and the frets don't. And so then they stick out, so that's not acceptable. There's, there's a lot of things there. You're going to get one of these in your case. This is a truss rod wrench. This is for adjusting this truss rod and changing the tension to whether the neck is bent this way or that way. Also on the top of the neck, you're going to have a nut. So this nut sits here up on the f top. And you can ha have them made out of many different kinds of material. This material is a plastic that's full of bronze powder and glass. Um, this is a bone uh, from a cow. And how well the nut is cut changes how high the strings are off the first fret. Um, if you've got a string laying down on the fret because this slot in here, let's get a close-up of this, you'll have to take the instrument to a repairman or send it to our repair shop, PTC, to get it adjusted. It's not uncommon that an old guitar needs these metal things replaced. That's called a refret, or you want to get the, a new nut put on it, or they call it nut work that gets done with the instrument, or you want to get the instrument intonated, which is how long the string is. There's a lot of little repair things. And I'm trying to go over these terms so that when you're talking to the guitar repairman who is kind of like your guitar doctor, um, you can use the correct terms. All right, so now we've made a neck. And we've got to put it into a body. So 
you can make the body out of one piece of wood. That's three pieces of wood glued together into one piece of wood. This would be swamp ash. If it's going to get a curly maple top, like this guitar, there's a sandwich between two pieces of curly maple and a, and a mahogany back. And the reason the sandwich happens is the trees don't grow that big. And so the tree would have to be actually pretty big for you to get a one-piece top that's 13 inches wide out of it. So very often what they'll do is they'll take a top like this and a piece of wood about this size and they'll slice it down the middle and open it like a book. It's called a book match top. And you can imagine that the tree doesn't have to be as big to get this piece of wood out of it than to get a piece that's already this big out of it, right? And that will get glued to a back. Now this is a one piece back. This is a mahogany back. If you look at the rings, this was a big tree. <laughs> I mean, you can see the rings on the end of it. And it, it rings like a bell. It's got a nice sound to it. Um, you can glue it to a curly maple top like this. Um, and cut a bunch of holes in it. Cut a hole in it to get the neck. Cut holes in it for the pickups. Cut holes in it for your electronics, for the tremolo, for the uh, piezo system, or whatever it is. It's a pretty sophisticated thing that you attach to the neck. It's called the body. And when it's done, you cover the electronics up with a cover. You put all the parts in it and you have yourself a guitar. Now, I know that's simplistic, but important. So, once again with the body, you can have one piece body, you can have a three piece body, you can have two pieces of curly maple or one piece of curly maple glued to a piece of mahogany. You could glue it to swamp ash. There's piles of ways to make a body. But then what happens is this neck goes into this body. And how, what the neck angle is decides how high the bridge is. There's a lot of art forms in here. But that said, now you're starting to have a guitar. There are a couple of different ways to do the attachment of the neck. One's to bolt it on with four really big teethed sheet metal screws. And the other one is to glue the neck in like this. And people always ask me, what's the difference between a, <laughs> a bolt-on neck and a glue-in neck? I said, one's bolted on, one's glued in. But if you imagine this guitar, and you plug it into the amp, and then you flood the entire cavity right here, where the neck is bolted on with super glue, and you take the four bolts out, it's not going to sound that much different. We've done that test in a way where you flood the, the cavity of a bolt-on neck with, with super glue or any kind of glue and glue it on and see what the difference is. It's really subtle. But people generally separate electric guitars into bolt-on necks and glue-in necks. Um, and I think it's mostly because of the way they're constructed. This doesn't have a curly maple top. It's got single coil pickups in it. There's a pick guard on it to hold the pickups. Um, this has a maple fretboard instead of a rosewood fretboard. There are a lot of other differences that make a big difference. Okay, now we have to finish the guitar. But before we finish it, let's talk a little bit about glues. Here's a glue for gluing the top on. Um, here's a glue for gluing the curly maple together. Um, we use glues for gluing this fretboard on. Actually, we use an epoxy to glue that, net, that fretboard on. Um, because I don't want the water that you sweated onto the fretboard to get to the mahogany. Um, it's important to me. I, uh, I, I have spent a lot of time with these glues. It is one of the tools that a guitar maker has to make this instrument. Obviously, this has to be glued on, this has got to be glued on, that's got to be glued on, the frets have got to be glued on, this has got to be glued on. I mean, there's glue used everywhere on a guitar. It's a, you know, wood is one of our um, 
tools that we use to make instruments, truss rods, frets, but glue is a big deal. Um, you can uh, have a big gap and fill the gap with glue or you can try to get the wood to touch. Um, all these things are important and the reason I'm picking these up is these need to be glued in. <laughs> these inlays, you don't want them to fall out. And we use super glue to glue in inlays. Uh, it's it works really, really well. All right, so now you have an instrument, right? And now you got to finish it. So there are yellow dyes, there are blue dyes, there are red dyes, and combinations of all these dyes. This obviously has a blue-black dye on it. Um, and this is a black paint that we put on the back. How thick the paint is, how hard it is and how crystalline it is has a big influence on what, how the guitar sounds. If this paint is really soft and it's really thick, it's going to deaden the guitar. If the instrument has a very, very thin finish on it and it's crystalline, it's going to let the guitar have a sound. The finish wasn't invented on a guitar to make it sound better. The finish was invented to keep when you sweat it on the instrument to keep it from turning you know, brown or black. It was, it, was, it was invented to protect the instrument. And then it became an art form. I mean, this is a complete art form, um, finishing an instrument like this. And you want the thing to ring like crazy, you know? <laughs> to ring like crazy so you don't want the finish to shut the instrument down you spend all this time building the instrument you don't want the finish to shut it down so what we do here is we use dyes and we we dye the wood uh, a color uh, and then we start to spray on coats of uh, uh, lacquer uh, of different kinds and then we'll spray color coats on them and there's a lot of work that goes into the finish. A full third of the instrument is in the finish department. You've got to, to get the woods, you've got to get them all dried out, you've got to make the instrument, you've got to get it to be just right, then it goes into the finish room, it gets all of its finishes on it, and then it's got to go into final assembly, and we've got to make the instrument work, you know? And so we'll start to get into making the magnetic microphones, making these pickups. It's a whole art form, all on its own. There are companies in our industry, this is all they do is make pickups. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, uh, this has been going better and better and better for our company. Um, this is a set of 5815 LTs, and these are pickups that are the Paul's guitar that are sitting down here. We also have pickups that are in the bridge for our piezo system. There's a big electronics package that hooks to the bridge so you can control the sound. What's not well understood about our piezo system on our guitars made in, here in Maryland is, and I want to get a close-up of this, there are six separate volume controls inside the guitar so you can adjust every single string's volume. And, uh, you know, it's not just that there's a battery in there, but there's also these controls so that you can adjust the the volume of the strings, which I think is cool. On guitars without the piezo system, you've got volume pots, tone controls, all kinds of stuff. Switches like this for deciding which pickup is on. You've got a way to plug the guitar in so that you can make it out to the amplifier. There's all kinds of stuff. Now, you can have a bridge that adjusts the tension of the string, it's called a tremolo, and you can have it move and the string gets looser and tighter and looser and tighter, and, and that's our tremolo bridge. You can also have what we call a straight bridge, which um, is what's on this blue guitar down here below me. And uh, it is the origin of where the string starts to vibrate. Now, I got to tell you, this is really important. Where the string starts to vibrate and how it starts to vibrate and how it ends vibrating has a huge impact on the sound. So imagine a high E string. It weighs a couple of grams. Anything it touches is going to affect its sound. And um, 
how these bridges are made have an extraordinarily high impact on the sound of the electric guitar. Same thing on an acoustic guitar, you know, how well that uh, bone saddle sits in the bridge and how it's cut, and all have a monstrous impact on the sound of the guitar. If you're not happy with the sound of the guitar, it may have something to do with the nut of the bridge, and um, a, a very skilled repairman will have an idea of what to do. In addition, there are these things called tuning pegs, tuning machines. They are the device at the top of the guitar for adjusting the tension of the string. And once again, like the bridge, they have an impact on the sound of the guitar, and they have a real impact on whether the guitar stays in tune or not. And these tuning pegs, um, <laughs> uh, they're kind of uh, one of my favorite things because when you're getting into the subtle difference between a, a okay guitar, a pretty good guitar, a better guitar, a great guitar, unbelievably magic guitar, everything makes a difference and this is part of the formula. Also, there are some ancillary things like the screws that hold the tremolo bridge on or the screws that hold the straight bridge on or the knobs that go onto the pots. Um, you've got back plates that cover up the tremolo springs or back plates that cover up the electronics parts. And then you have strings. These are the six strings on an electric guitar. They're all different sizes. Three of them are wound uh, with an with a internal core and then something wound around it, and three of them are plain. It's just a piece of wire. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a guitar with the same strings on it for two years, and people go, I, I wonder where the high end went. I mean, real musicians are changing strings like almost daily. Uh, it's not uncommon to see the guitar that was played the night before get completely cleaned up and have its strings changed. These plain strings really don't go dead, although they do get coated with a lot of dirt. These wound strings go dead as a doornail. So they went da 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 da, and then when they're dead they go doo 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 doo. They don't have any high end. And I think it's really important that you change strings on a guitar. It's a very common thing. Now on a nylon string acoustic guitar, they're not changed anywhere near as often as they would say on an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar. Um, there's a thing in our industry with these coated strings where the strings don't go dead anywhere near as fast and I think that's good for our industry. Um, but you should find a brand of string. Now we make strings, PRS sells them. Um, I think it's really important that you have a steady supply of strings around and you're changing them. I can't tell you how many times at a recording session I've turned around and the musician said, change the low strings on your guitar, change the ones that are wrapped because it has a real effect on how well you can hear the low register stuff that the musician is playing. I can't stress this enough. I talked to somebody on the phone yesterday, said he hadn't changed his strings in over two and a half years and he was proud of it. And I'm like, please give me the guitar, let me change the strings, you know. All right. Then you got little teeny things, like truss rod covers, for covering the truss rod up so that you don't see it. Um, there are little teeny things um, having to do with uh, what kind of screws we use, you know. But for the most part, that's the guitar. That's the master class, that is the instrument. Look, it used to be that guitars were brought into the repair shops all the time and worked on. And we got into a throwaway world. We got into a world where if your TV's broken, you throw it out and get a new one. If the microwave's broken, you throw it out and get a new one. If the stove's broken, you throw it out and get a new one. It used to be in the old days that if the TV was broken, you brought it to the TV repair shop and they fixed it. So I'm with my wife one day in the Atlanta airport. Here comes a guy walking by, holding an acoustic guitar like this, going by me, and he has no case for the guitar. And I said, that's the problem. She goes, what do you mean? I said, what's he going to do when it breaks? She said, throw it away. I said, exactly. I don't want instruments like that. Instruments are to be cared for by, uh, by, uh, peop by techs, by guitar repairmen. Um, 
I have my guitars in the shop all the time to get them just adjusted and tweaked up and taken care of. And I think it's important that you just don't see it as a, a throwaway world. You see it as these instruments are meant to be taken care of and loved and uh, make sure that they have the upkeep that they need. I think that's really, really important. You know, I haven't talked much about how PRS does these things different, but I'm telling you, if I'm able to give you this master class and show you generally what's going on, imagine my office is full of very sophisticated questions about each of these parts constantly. And we are guitar makers by trade. We don't see ourselves just as a brand. We see ourselves as guitar makers, guitar makers, guitar makers. And we've got about 350 very skilled people here making guitars, and I'm proud of what they do. I like people that know what they're doing. Anyway, it's Paul. That's my master class. See you guys later. Bye-bye.